They were designed to be the best. They met enemies face to face, endured tragedies and enjoyed victories. They went down in history due to the bravery of their crews. They are the ships that deserve to be called Naval Legends. In this episode, USS Alabama, the long life of the Lucky A. The battleships define the might and effectiveness of the naval fleet of major sea powers in the first half of the 20th century. These vessels incorporated the latest scientific and technical achievements. Each new ship received thicker armour and more powerful large calibre guns. The battleships were becoming real sea giants. To put a stop to the naval arms race, a conference was convened in Washington in 1922. The major sea powers reached an agreement to reduce the number of battleships, limit their primary armament caliber, the displacement, and other characteristics. Despite the strict limitations imposed by the treaty, scientific progress allowed participating countries to continuously upgrade the speed, the armor, and the armament of their battleships. The U.S. battleships of the South Dakota class are one of the most successful examples of the new design approach. It included four vessels, USS Alabama being the last of them. We're standing on the deck of the battleship USS Alabama BB-60 that was actually, uh, she, uh, the keel was laid February the 1st, uh, 1940. Uh, it took over 3,000 men and women working 24 hours a day, 30 months to build the ship. She was uh, christened February 16th, 42. She was uh, commissioned into the United States Navy on August the 16th of 1942, she served four and a half years, earned five, nine battle stars. Total displacement, 44,500 tons. Length, 680 feet. Beam, 108 feet. Draft, 36 feet. Armament, primary armament, nine Mark VI guns in three turrets. Caliber, 16 inch. Range of fire, armor piercing shells, 18.2 miles. High explosive shells, 19.8 miles. Dual purpose artillery, 10 Mark 28 turrets with two Mark 12 guns each. Caliber, five inch. Anti-aircraft artillery, 12 quadruple Bofors guns. 48 Olicon Mark 234 78 cannons. Air group from two to three OS2U float planes. Armor. Belt 12.2 inches. Primary armament turrets from 7.2 to 18 inches. Conning tower from 4 to 16 inches. Maximal speed 27 knots. Range 13,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. US engineers managed to give the new battleships quite a high speed and an impressive self-sustainability. The vessels were agile enough to escort aircraft carriers and the cruising range allowed them to sail halfway around the globe. The key to this endurance was the main power plant of the Alabama, installed in four engine rooms. Like I said, you can see basically what appears to be operational turbines and steam generators that. The actual bores are, are, follow me, are this way. When fully operational, uh, at peak capacity, it's 130,000 brake horsepower. And as I said, it drove a 45,000 ton uh, or a 90 million pound uh, ship, approximately 31 miles an hour, 28 knots. USS Alabama's armament is worthy of special attention. Only two ship classes were more powerfully armed. The newest US Iowa class and the Japanese Yamato class, the biggest battleships in the world. The Alabama's main battery consisted of nine guns of 16 inch caliber, installed in two forward turrets and one aft turret. The primary armaments magazine was located two levels below the main deck. 
This is an area called the Barbette, and this is one of the stations where the big 16-inch shells were uh, loaded and put up in a hoist uh, up above me here and loaded into the big guns to be fired, the big 16-inch guns that you see in the front and the back of the battleship. It was very, very difficult work, very hot conditions in here. The pictures that are around this room, the photographs, uh, shows men, big kind of burly men with big arms and because you need a lot of strength to work in here. Uh, they will put chains around these uh, uh, shells or so and then put them into the hoist and send them up to be fired. A sophisticated system of gyroscopes and analog calculators was responsible for targeting. Gunners supplied the system with necessary data, such as target characteristics, speed and direction of the wind, and wear rate of the barrels. USS Alabama had from two to three float planes on board for air reconnaissance and spotting when the ship was firing at shore targets. Surface targets were tracked and aimed at with the help of radars, pride and joy of the US Navy. Uh, it's a place where radar, visual aid, and radio uh, contact all came together, and um, also sonar. And uh, so what you have here is this kind of the brain trust or the nervous system of the ship. So all the information was collected here and dispersed to the rest of the ship. The dual purpose Mark 12 guns were designed to destroy both enemy ships and aircraft. They used shells equipped with non-contact fuses, thus dramatically increasing the efficiency of the anti-aircraft fire. The battleship's anti-aircraft armament during the war also included an ever-increasing number of 40mm Bofors and 20mm Oerlikon automatic guns. Uh, I had enough anti-aircraft power shot down 22 aircraft. That's confirmed 22. The crew said they shot down twice that many, but you know, who knows. To increase the defense of the ship without exceeding the displacement limit, the all-or-nothing approach was adopted. The armor protected only the vital components of the vessel, such as the conning tower, the primary armament, the machinery spaces, and the rudder gear. The ship's ends remained unarmored. To further save weight, an inner armor belt was introduced in the design. It represented a relatively thin plating of reinforced steel covering the main bulk of armour. The construction was sufficiently light and was considered to be very effective against the armour-piercing shells. But regardless of all the innovations, the engineers still had to shorten the vessel's hull by 20 metres compared to the North Carolina battleship. Officers were accompanied in double cabins. The crew quarters housed two, three and even four tier berths. Still, in spite of the space saving, the American designers managed to find place for a dentist's office, an operating room, a barber shop, a store and even a pantry. Five hundred men on the sh ship at any one time during World War II. So you would have had uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the three meals of the day. And in front of me right now, you're seeing the breakfast side. We've got all kinds of things for the guys to eat here, including sausage patties. Uh, we have bread baking in the oven. And over here behind uh, this gentleman, we've got things like uh, rice, and also they also had grits once in a while in the morning. Uh, we also have breakfast cereal and things like uh, fresh fruit whenever they in port they got fresh supplies so they had things like apples and oranges. Battleships uh, made the ice cream, had the guidons in them, sold uh, uh, ice cream floats, things like that. One statistic, it, uh, it's, it's thought that about a hundred gallons of ice cream and or um, sodas were served or given to the uh, enlisted crew and the officers per day here on the ship. So 100 gallons of ice cream and soda, that's a lot for one day. And this is the barbershop for the uh, enlisted crewmen, so this is not for the officers. Um, you would have had three master barbers down here, men who cut hair, and then they had two apprentices. If the, general, if the men wanted a certain style or something like that that was allowed by the um, uh, Navy military, Rigid discipline was maintained on the ship, but considering the number of people aboard, more than 2,500, minor offences were inevitable. 
what's called the temporary brig. Some people call it the pen or the slammer, like slamming a jail door. And this was the uh, temporary uh, jail area for guys that were uh, crewmen who eventually were on leave, either got drunk and came back, or they were in a fight, something like that, something minor. Now down below us, one deck, we have the actual, the actual brig where the more major offenses. They weren't allowed to have a lot of things except for maybe a little bit of reading material or some cards or something like that as you would see in here. After her commissioning, USS Alabama was sent to the Atlantic Ocean. The US battleships were tasked with holding back the German fleet in the north, while the British ships moved to the Mediterranean to prepare the assault on Sicily. In July 1943, the Alabama joined the raid on Norwegian shores. The Allied forces attempted to lure out the Tirpitz, but the German battleship preferred to stay under cover of Fjords. Neither the Tirpitz nor the Alabama had a chance to fight a comparable ship in their careers. These battleships, giants created to assure superiority in the naval realms, never engaged in a serious battle with a similar type of opponent of equal strength. USS Alabama, however, managed to distinguish herself during one of the major engagements in the Pacific Ocean, the largest aircraft carrier battle between the US and Japan, known as the Battle for the Mariana Islands or the Battle of the Philippine Sea. In case the Americans captured the Mariana Islands, they could regularly bomb Japanese cities and cut off the land of the rising sun from strategic resources in the West Indies. Japan could not afford to lose them and sent almost all its carrier-borne aviation to fight off the enemy fleet. USS Alabama, transferred earlier to the Pacific Ocean, joined the battle as part of the screening force for the aircraft carriers. Thanks to her state-of-the-art radar, the battleship was able to detect approaching Japanese aircraft at a distance of almost 160 miles. And in 1944, it was inconceivable. None of the task force ships could confirm the target. And only at a distance of 140 miles did the battleship Iowa confirm the detection. Upon receiving confirmation, the U.S. fleet commander ordered his aircraft carriers to launch their fighters. One of the pilots from the aircraft carrier Lexington described this engagement as an old-time turkey shootdown. This nickname stuck, and the battle went down in history as the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. U.S. pilots and ships destroyed more than 500 Japanese planes and killed the majority of experienced pilots. In fact, the Japanese carrier-borne aviation ceased to exist. It is after the Battle of the Philippine Sea that the Japanese command had to resort to their last trump in the Pacific War, kamikaze attacks. Eventually, the US military operations in the Pacific and the Soviet offensive in Manchuria forced the Japanese to lay down arms. The surrender of the land of the rising sun was signed aboard the US battleship Missouri USS Alabama also had an honorary role. The ship's principal pride was after the surrender documents were signed on September the 2nd, 45, the next day that the Alabama led the American fleet into Tokyo Bay. Pretty soon after World War II, it became obvious that giant battle fleets did not meet the requirements of modern warfare. No matter how big the guns, they were no match for the range and destructive power of aircraft and missiles. Little by little, battleships were decommissioned. USS Alabama's turn came in the beginning of the 1960s. She was towed to her permanent berth in Mobile Bay and became the main exhibit of the exposition dedicated to the US armed forces and their role in World War II. We've been open actually to the public since 1965, hosting more than 14 million visitors. We've been very happy to see that over the last several years that, that uh, the younger audience has been very appreciative of learning the history of what made America great and also what made these vessels so important there. USS Alabama was nicknamed the Lucky A. 
because she did not receive any damage during her service, nor did she lose a single crew member to enemy fire. Now she keeps watch, helping to preserve the memory of the greatest naval warfare of all time.